pharmacology, and uh, they had this idea to start thinking about preeclampsia uh, exploration using the plasma drops and the placenta. Prior to that, they only, uh, the, the research was only focusing on the uh, plasma drops, blood plasma drops. But then we started to think about uh, what's going on for the placenta and if it has a vital role in causing this disease. Before going to the uh, topic of, uh, of the talk, I would like to pay a few words to Sesame Light Source. And I would like to show you uh, what kind of applications those we uh, performed there and some examples on the biophysics uh, domain uh, investigations at the IR uh, beamline uh, at Sesame. So Sesame is a uh, internet intergovernmental organization, a synchrotron facility, and it's well known as uh, CERN of the Middle East. It's uh, the only synchrotron facility in the, in the region. And uh, it's um, designated for two things, for excellence of science and as a bridge for peace in the region. The, uh, the map that you see here uh, to the bottom, to the bottom left, where the members are Cyprus, Egypt, Iran, Israel, Jordan, Pakistan, Palestine, and Turkey, with a number of uh, observers, including the European Union, different European countries, UK, United States, and others, are providing Sesame with expertise, either technical or uh, uh, scientific, and also in some cases as financial. Uh, Sesame is the only synchrotron facility in the region, and uh, if you look at this map, it's one of around 60 synchrotron facilities all over the world. And I'd like to uh, pay uh, a, a word here also for the African Light Source, since we are uh, in a conference about Africa. That still now there is no uh, light source in Africa, but uh, uh, luckily we are moving forward uh, towards having uh, this facility in our continent. And Sesame recently, at the end of 2020, signed MOU with the African Light Source Foundation. I look forward to fruitful uh, cooperation. So synchrotron radiation is basically a bunch of electromagnetic waves emitted by charged particles. In our case, they are electrons. Those are moving in a curved trajectory at a speed close to the speed of light. This uh, featured light or featured radiation extends over a broad band of energies from infrared to X-rays. It can observe naturally as the emission from Crab Nebula, but also can, can be produced in synchrotron light sources. Uh, one of them is Sesame, and this radiation has unique properties, thus open a spectrum of opportunities. And what is nice also is that we can combine two or three, whatever techniques in order to uh, fully explore a case under study. So uh, the applications, those are uh, performed at any synchrotron facility and also at Sesame and hopefully in the future at the African Light Source uh, are um, starting with uh, industry like cement, uh, ceramics, textiles, corrosion, batteries, uh, pharmaceuticals, also for cultural heritage, archaeology, bioarchaeology, and paleontology. And our region is rich in all these uh, uh, topics. And also for the basic sciences as physics, chemistry, biology, and all what in between, such as biophysics and biochemistry, and um, agriculture, drug design, and um, um, environment. Synchrotron facilities, when, since we are speaking about biophysics, I had to uh, show how successful the synchrotron facilities managed to work on human health. And here you see a group of uh, new drugs, a new, um, sorry, uh, a set of some uh, viruses, those the synchrotron facilities managed to provide us with new drugs uh, using the synchrotron radiation, such as influenza, SARS, hepatitis C virus, and with snail fever, et cetera. 
And also we could get some insights by imaging and mapping techniques, either with infrared or X-rays uh, to highlight the origin and the function of uh, some diseases such as brain stroke, Matkal disease, Alzheimer, and also uh, working for uh, breast cancer and drug delivery systems. Not only that, also with the COVID-19, circuit room facilities were at the front line and uh, different synchrotrons all over the world open calls for uh, rapid access to urge scientists to enter and to perform experiments to find a cure or to know how to find these uh, newly developed virus. So since we're talking about human health and also um, uh, biophysics, uh, we have to speak also about the complex molecular network systems. Uh, as all the biological um, uh, molecules and biological networks are designated as um, uh, complex ones. And if this large block is representing a molecular network system, then also this one is showing us how complicated the system is inside a single cell. So this implying uh, that we need to move over different scientific axes like uh, medicine, biology, biophysics, structural biology, uh, pharmaceuticals and drug design. And also uh, we need to find a way for a possible diagnostic uh, test. So this can be accomplished by using different experimental techniques, such as um, using infrared or X-rays, but different techniques such as X-ray diffraction, SACS, uh, infrared microspectroscopy, X-ray imaging, tomography, and other scanning tools. And with this, we can have an idea about uh, the biological system starting from a single atom, passing by molecules, organelles, cells, until tissues. And sometimes we can also have some information working on uh, uh, organs. So this is uh, the world map of diseases in the Middle East, and not only the Middle East. But uh, our researchers show a lot of interest in working on uh, these targets, such as breast cancer, liver, liver cancer, diabetes, and bilharzia. And also extending this to Africa, also human health in Africa has a great share of um, a particular set of uh, diseases, but we are looking forward to uh, fight them as long as uh, the hope is still there. Until we have the African light source, uh, we can do our best in other synchrotron facilities or any other institution. So some of the targets that the synchrotron helped in Africa were like uh, finding a potential uh, new antimalarial drug, the Ebola virus, the AIDS, and also uh, preeclampsia, which is what I'm going to speak about in a few minutes. So before going to this, I, as I said, I want to give you an idea of uh, some examples of what uh, was performed at the infrared beam line at Sesame concerning the biophysical domains. We had experiments on wound healing, on diabetic food, on blood plasma for diagnostics and transdermal delivery. And these are uh, some recent publications about these uh, studies. We have also studied the um, unfolding behavior of collagen nanofibers using synchrotron infrared microspectroscopy. Also uh, induced Alzheimer's disease in right brain cortical tissue characterization of insulin nucleotide films, and also the, uh, the topic of today's talk, which is preeclampsia, uh, studying the placenta and plasma by infrared microspectroscopy. So speaking about this uh, in Africa, um, the maternal health in Africa is also under focus. 
as the preeclampsia is a serious multi-system um, hypertensive pregnancy disorder with unclear etiology and lack of reliable diagnostic tools. And here, these two maps are showing themselves without any comment how far the preeclampsia and the maternal mortality ratios are high in Africa with respect to the whole world. So having this fact sheet here is saying that between 1990 and 2010, Africa has reduced maternal deaths by 41%. Uh, but despite the progress, 57% of all maternal deaths occur on the continent, giving Africa the highest maternal mortality ratio in the world. So preeclampsia is still considered one of the leading causes of maternal and fetal uh, morbidity and mortality worldwide, uh, especially in low and middle uh, income uh, countries, because it's it potentially affects the mother's future health and also the quality of her life by increasing the risk of developing cardiovascular diseases. And this is a map of uh, the size of territory, territory a drawing according to the proportion of maternal deaths that occur in the country. So we studied the preeclampsia, uh, placenta and plasma drops using infrared microspectroscopy. So simply and quickly, the infrared um, is vibrational spectroscopy technique. It relies on the interaction between the matter and the infrared radiation. And it gives active molecular specific vibrations. Those can be identified and assigned. If we're working with the normal Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy, then this is the case. And we are using a normal uh, conventional black body uh, infrared source. But if we are working with synchrotron microspectroscopy, this hot filament or black body uh, source, infrared source is replaced by high intense, very focused, and of high flux infrared beam produced by the, by the uh, by synchrotron uh, ring. And uh, we add to the normal spectrometer a microscope, infrared microscope, but the basics are still the same. This is the end station of the IR beam line where we do the experiments. So we have here part of the beam line delivering the synchrotron infrared from inside the storage ring, passing through several um, optical elements, basically mirrors, passing to the spectrometer, then passing to the microscope where we do our experiments. So with this technique, we can do mapping, not only the traditional spectroscopy, but we can also do mapping or imaging techniques and uh, this is a study, for example, for analysis of mycobacteria and gram-negative bacteria. This is the visual image that is obtained by uh, um, visual uh, objective or visible light objective. And this is the corresponding infrared map that is called also chemical map that is produced by interacting uh, the infrared radiation with the, uh, with the sample. So not only we are able to get spectra, but we also get maps. And these maps uh, are very useful in giving us information about the distribution of the uh, molecules. So we know where is the uh, protein group uh, located. We know where is the lipids are located because from one map, for the whole sample, we are able to extract protein map and lipid map and any significant molecular vibration map. This is another example of what we can uh, do. Um, this is unstained section of uh, brain, uh, rat brain uh, tissue. 
This is the chemical image obtained by the infrared. And here you get uh, the total lipid map for the control tissue. Here, a total protein map for the control tissue and the corresponding ones, again, for total lipid and total protein for the stroke uh, tissues. This is another one, another example. Again, you have the histological view and you get the protein distribution, the lipid and the calcium hydroxapatite distribution since in this study, the samples are bones. So we are focusing also on calcium hydroxapatite. So for the preeclampsia, in this study, we try to use the infrared microspectroscopy to monitor the molecular uh, changes associated um, with the pathogenesis um, of uh, the preeclampsia via in examining uh, two things. First, the plasma drops, and second, the placental tissues. Uh, and the target was a group uh, two groups. One is uh, pre um women, and the other group is the normal cancer uh, matched uh, controls. We worked on four and four. So here you see the maternal demographic and clinical characteristics of the pre cases and their matched controls. They all had uh, almost uh, uh, comparable age, comparable body mass index, and uh, they almost had also the um, quite similar uh, blood pressure at booking. But uh, outside labor, you see here that for the pre women, the high blood pressure is showing itself, and also the gestation age is less compared to the controls. Those are healthy pregnant women. And also for the infant birth weight, it was less than that for the healthy pregnant women. So using uh, this uh, uh, standard uh, spectrum for, bio for any biological <clears throat> matter, <clears throat> we are able to uh, identify uh, the uh, vibrational uh, 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 absorption, uh, either for the carbohydrate, the nucleic acids, the protein bands, or the lipid ones like this. Like at each wave number, at each position, we can identify the absorption occurring there. And here, there are three things that matter. The band position or the peak position, the, uh, the peak shape also, and the, the peak intensity. And each, if each gives a different information. So for the plasma spectral features and also for the placenta, what we did as choosing biomarkers, we worked on two different regions. A is the lipid region, and B is the protein region per, in addition to this uh, small uh, lipid vibrational uh, peak, vibrational band. So <clears throat> in general, what was observed is that uh, the, the, the lipid region showed the distinct markers between the control and the preeclampsia. The preeclampsia is that shown in red and the blue is the one of the control uh, samples. So we saw a distinctive uh, features between both distinctive separation when uh, we started to analyze the data. And uh, that distinctive separation showed also in the protein of the plasma. So here you see each group is clustered in a separate domain when we worked with this multivariate analysis technique. So in general, uh, we saw um, new speeches, those were developed for the lipid 
and we saw decrease in the intensity of the proteins and additional with other uh, analysis, we saw also that um, there is a disorder or a change in the conformation of the proteins, they're changing their secondary structure conformation from alpha helices to beta sheets and beta turns. So that was the disruption of the uh, order of the uh, protein molecules in the uh, plasma. For the placenta, uh, this is uh, a tissue uh, of the uh, control. And this is B is a tissue of pre eclamptic case. And all uh, these both maps, uh, the chemical maps are showing uh, um, the distribution uh, of proteins and the, um, the color code is that uh, blue is less intensity and red is more intensity. So this gives us an information also on the distribution. And what we did here also in order to get a comprehensive information about the role of placenta is that we collected samples uh, from three different regions of placenta, the left, the right, and upper. And uh, we measured the three locations for each sample. And uh, what we found is that there was no significant um, uh, separation between uh, them, not in the region of lipids and not in the region of um, uh, proteins. And this confirmed that um, there is a homogeneity in the placenta uh, and uh, uh, that it doesn't matter where the tissue is taken from, uh, all the uh, regions showed the same uh, behavior. So what we did after that is that we combined all these spectra and moved to the uh, further analysis uh, on the placenta. So we analyzed the lipids features again for the placenta by multivariate technique. And then also we analyze the proteins features. And this is a conclusive uh, um, table showing the uh, positions and fractional areas of the amide one and amide two of the proteins for both the plasma and the uh, placenta tissue. Uh, and uh, what we did is that we made it like this, that shows the alterations in the preeclampsia. So there were different things uh, observed. Either there was um, a shift to higher frequency or to lower frequency or a weak signal or high signal, uh, less and in peak intensities, difference in wets, so almost all the markers that we use in infrared spectroscopy when we are dealing with peaks or bands like the peak width, position, and intensity were uh, manifested in this study. And uh, based on that, we reached uh, these conclusions uh, that uh, it's for the first time uh, a decrease in the alpha helix protein structure, which is uh, one of the secondary structures of protein responsible for the protein's uh, function, leading to uh, a disease, a possible disease, and the formation of less abundant protein secondary structure, the 310 helix, uh, both uh, in, in placenta and plasma were detected. And also a decrease in the alpha helix, uh, converting these alpha helices into uh, beta sheet and beta turns uh, could be uh, associated to uh, oxidation conditions for the preeclamptic tissues. Then these 310 newly developed uh, secondary structure of protein, that is the 310 helix structure, has been proposed to act as intermediate conformation in the folding and unfolding of the alpha uh, helix. 
And we found that uh, we found that um, um, a similar disorder of the protein structure and a damage of the amino acid uh, of the side chains uh, have been also reported using micro Raman uh, spectroscopy. Um, Besides the conformational change, also we noticed a decrease in the amide one and amide two peaks of protein detected in the uh, uh, plasma uh, of the uh, preeclampsia uh, that uh, led to um, a conclusion of a possibility of having alterations in the protein synthesis as a consequence of the damage caused by the released uh, reactive alt is also in line with previous study where uh, they also reported, the authors also reported decrease in the alpha helix. Um, but what they did is that they worked only with the tra traditional uh, FTIR uh, spectroscopy on uh, plasma uh, drops. Not on plasma. This is uh, ongoing um, uh, prospect. We, we tried this test, uh, but now we have to continue that uh, we are mapping the drops. So here you see the distribution of the proteins at the section of the drop. distribution of the lipid and it's clear that uh, and the, where is there it's a nice way to highlight the distribution in the tissue and it's nice way also to know more about this um, um, disease and uh, I think I finished so I thank you so much for listening if there are questions or uh, information to be provided uh, please uh, drop me an email uh, to this email address Thank you so much. Thank you. So let's uh, let's open up the floor for questions. Trevor, or I don't know if that does that hand does that hand mean applause or Trevor? Do you have a question or is that an applause hand? It's applause. Oh, okay. it's applause. It's a <laughs> <laughs> question. One looks like this. I can't even find okay. It. <laughs> and I'm not asking a question. It's fine. I, 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 would, I do want to ask a question. Have you got a protein beam line? A, a protein crystallography beam line? Sorry? Do you have a protein crystallography beam line? Um, we're supposed to have a protein crystallography beam line uh, whenever there will be enough fund. So there is uh, an attempt to have it soon, but we are still looking for the rest of the fund. Okay. Is there, is there another question before I ask one of my own? <laughs> so, uh, is there a, is there a correlation between the um, sort of mechanical stiffness of uh, placenta uh, placenta tissue and the lipid and protein content? Uh, yeah, we checked that, but it didn't, it didn't show a distinctive uh, difference. Mm. Because for us, it, it, um, it appears as uh, the, the thickness of the tissue. This is what we uh, care about in order to get uh, some data. And the, the, the tissues of the placenta were not easy to work with because they are full of blood. They are basically blood right. tissues. So it was kind of challenge to uh, choose the, uh, the, the, uh, the proper cuts of the uh, tissues and also to, to, to be able to section them at the uh, proper thickness where we can uh, uh, easily get a signal. So in, I mean, the preparatory period for the, uh, for the experiment was longer than the time taken for the, for the experiment itself. Mm -hmm. Lawrence Elvis wants to ask a question. His hand is up. Oh, yes, please, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Uh, 
That was a very good talk. Um, so in terms of the sensitivity, will you be able to determine that at the earlier stages of preeclampsia? Um, no, I don't think so. Okay, so what Not stage of... Okay, go ahead. Uh, sorry? I say, what stage of the preeclampsia can you actually confidently determine? I mean, what we can com confidently determine is the molecular uh, changes. Those are associated with the tissues, comparing, the, comparing them to the uh, control ones. But of course, I mean, what, what I can say is that we worked on, uh, as I said, four individuals of each group but uh, after that, we collected uh, a lot of samples to increase the data set in order to repeat the, uh, the experiment again on a larger data set in order to be completely uh, and comprehensively uh, aware of everything is going on. But this disease is really, I mean, uh, it's, it's really difficult to, uh, to to be confident about it in just one uh, experiment. Okay, thank you, thank you. But your your sample, you get your samples postpartum. Is that correct? Yeah. So now, um, what is what are the prospects of using the technique as a sort of a medical imaging technique? So it's a, a prenatal. Yeah, it's possible. It's possible also. That will be nice also. Yeah. Right. So I think that's like one, one of the, can you imagine a light source being a medical treatment facility too? Um, I think may, or may not in, be helpful. I think in, if I will understand your question, you're talking about having a medical treatment in a synchrotron facility. Yeah. Um, I, to, to my knowledge, in Eletra, uh, there is um, um, a branch of a beam line. I'm, I'm not sure uh, if, if, what's the, the name of that, um, but they are treating um, breast cancer. So it's a mammography, kind of mammography uh, beam line. Right, okay. And it's, I think it's associated to a hospital or tumor institute or something like this. So patients go there to receive doses and uh, it's used for medical treatment. Great. I swear I cannot find the raise your hand button on my console here. You go to reaction, you tick reactions and it's the one at the bottom, it says raise hand. It does not say that on my, it's just, it's the bunch of little icons. I see the clap, the thumbs up, the heart. Well, below it, below it, there's one that says raise hand. Not on my screen. <sighs> Lawrence uh, maybe, is not allowed to ask questions. Right, maybe because uh, the, maybe the moderator, the, uh, or the, the master Zoom account, doesn't get to ask questions. Anyway, any other questions? Sakazi, I know you have a, did you have a question? No, I was just saying that you are not allowed to ask questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but great talk, Jihan. So happy you were able to give the presentation. Thank you so much, Sakazi. Thank you so much. So if there's no other questions, then uh, I guess we can move on. Uh, we're a little early. But we can start the next talk, which I think I did see the speaker. That's Rodney. I saw you here in the gallery earlier. Rodney, are you still here? Yeah, I'm still around. Oh, yep, there you go. Okay. And so you're co-host, and you can start your talk. Okay. Share your share your screen. Yep. Whoa. Just a minute. What is it? Uh, 
just a minute. Finish it. I can find it here. It's a green tab at the bottom. Okay. Can you see it? Not yet. Uh, let me see. So you are you are a co-host. Uh, okay, go go ahead and try again. Okay. You should be able to share. Yeah, but it's not it's not part of what has been displayed, so it's difficult to kind of select it after clicking share. So just, uh, just give me some few minutes. I'll try to delete almost everything I have on the desktop and then um, what I've opened and then see if I'm able to see that and then just okay. a minute, yeah. There you go. Okay. Yeah, thank you. And right. Okay, sorry. Um, I'm Rodney. I'm to speak on the early detection of breast cancer with an optical Fourier domain system using microwave signals as source. Actually, this is an ongoing project. After we were able to successfully implement what we term as an optical Fourier domain system using microwave signals as a source. So I actually speak on having to have achieved detection with the instruments or the system that we implemented and how we hope to use that system to help in the early detection of breast cancer. So from the concept from OCT, we realized that they've been able to develop it into having to now bring it to a stage where they can use it for the purposes of imaging biological tissues. And here, what we seek to try to highlight is the fact that for OCT that helps us determine the images of biological tissues, we have the time domain, which my learned colleague, uh, prof uh, Professor Jiru Polovica, uh, was able to use that particular setup system that you can see, uh, this time replacing the broadband light source with uh, microwaves. And clearly he was able to propose that we can as well be able to use microwaves to determine the, uh, perform some uh, uh, imaging of uh, biological or tissues. So with knowledge or inspiration from Jerry's work, we proceeded to use the other type of the uh, OCT technique, which is the Fourier domain OCT technique. And then our system followed that of the swept source OCT technique, where we have both the reference and the sample um, all fixed. In this case, he varied using the time to make domain technique, he varied the reference arm. We kept both the reference and the sample arm fixed. And that was similar to the swept source OCT system, except that we replaced the swept laser with the microwave system. That is the microwave uh, source. Now, from dressless work, you would also realize that he was able to also obtain um, 
interference effects that possibly didn't require just having to obtain just the envelope, which has been the, the envelope which has been the measure that indicates that at least you are been able to got you have been able to get some kind of precision in terms of being able to uh, in, uh, being able to have a system that can now be able to that can be now that can be used for for imaging from dressless work he realized that from the pattern that he obtained he clearly could tell that that was the reference that was the interference uh, pattern which actually had a Gaussian a, a Gaussian spectrum and clearly from that we can also be able to obtain some depth profile information just as you can see on the slide as well. For every imaging system, most especially for ones that are going to use for imaging biological tissue, we try to find out how safe it is. So for us, we sought to find out which parts the microwave lies within the electron magnetic spectrum. And clearly you can see that it's within the, uh, it's, it's, it's part of the electromagnetic spectrum. And from microwaves, we move on to the, uh, uh, the, uh, the infrared, visible, and then the ultraviolet lights. Actually, the microwave has frequency from 3 gigahertz to 300 gigahertz. Now, what has been found from microwave studies that are, is underway or that are, have been studied is that these microwaves are not harmful when operated at low power. And for our case, since we seek to use it for imaging, it's only within some short time interval, normally some picoseconds or nanoseconds. So we do believe that it will not pose any health risk. So our choice of having to use microwaves, I think would suit the purpose for which we seek to image tissues that are soft such as uh, that of the human breast that we propose to detect, the case for which we have some form of a tumor that can lead to some cancer. Now we went, we, we followed the concept of OCT, and then here we had the interferometry, interferometry, interferometry system, where we've replaced the light source with our microwaves, and clearly, once a microwave falls within the range of the electromagnetic, the range of the electromagnetic spectrum, it, it actually satisfies, as we assume, all the properties that light waves also satisfy. Hence, we do believe that indeed, once we insert this microwaves into our system, in the interferometric system, we will be able to have some form of interference which would be detected. And that interference, out of that, we will be able to obtain the coherence length that we can compute with the round trip coherent length, having to model it as having to have a Gaussian ship, just like that for, for light. However, the results we obtained indicated that at a high sampling frequency, we are able to obtain an interferogram, which is what you see on figure B, at a high sampling frequency. And clearly from this and from what literature, and from literature, we realized that we, we need not worry ourselves if once we have the envelope or the interferogram to compute for the coherence length using the round trip. All one would probably would need would be to determine the coherence time from the width of the envelope. And then using the coherence time, we multiply that by the speed of, a, that by the speed of a light to obtain the coherence length in this particular case. However, having to have inserted a, sam a, a sample in the sample realm of our system, what we did observe was that we still obtain a similar interferogram, just like what we had on figure B. And at that stage, it was a bit difficult to tell whether indeed our system 
had determined the presence of the sample that has been inserted. So as a result of that, we actually use a low sampling frequency. And from the low sampling frequency, we were able to, sorry, from the low sampling frequency, when sample was not present, this figure E was the interference signal that we obtained, similar to what Drexler had obtained, for which for this you can't fix a perfect Gaussian shape to it and probably be able to use the round trip to determine the coherence length at low sampling frequencies. Our main concern here was to be able to tell that there has been some detection of the sample. So having to have inserted the sample in at low sampling frequency, what we obtained was what we have on figure E. And clearly, if you observe what you have on figure E, the interference effects were a bit white, quite spaced out as compared to the case where you had no sample in figure E. Clearly, having to look at that on figure H, we could tell that there has been some kind of interference effects that has not been observed in the case where there was no sample present. Hence, it means this interference signal we have when sample is present it has some bit of information that indicates that our sample has somewhat been detected. So based on that, we realize when we take the difference between the data sets that we have for figure H and that of figure E, we would be able to have a signal that reflects just that for the sample that has been inserted. Now, recent data that we have by varying separate samples has indicated that indeed, we still can obtain the envelope for the case where there is no sample for which we can be able to determine the coherence length using the coherence time times the speed of light to obtain the coherence length. And when sample is present, we still would obtain the envelope. But this time, the envelope as seen is a bit widely spaced, slightly widely spaced as compared to the previous figure that we have on figure K. Now, what we this time did was to obtain the data for the case where there was no sample present and the case where there was sample present. And clearly, if you observe what we have on figure N, you'd realize that we have here in all four columns, the first referring to the, the time, and then the, the, the second, third, and fourth referring to the uh, intensities. Now the second column, the first and second column represents the time domain data for the case where there was no sample present. And once you plot the, the, once you plot the first and second data sets, you obtain the interference, the interferogram for the case where no sample is present. If you plot the first and then the, the, the as in the first and then the third, you obtain the interferogram with the case for which you have sample present. Now, when we took the difference between the second and then the third data sets, what we have is what we have plotted. And clearly, as you see, you would be able to tell that this is the actual signal that tells us that the sample that has been inserted into our system has been detected. So based on this, we actually went on to try to perform some actual analysis by smoothening the data sets that we have for the case where there's sample presence and the case where there's no sample presence. And once we did that, what we obtained was what we have to our left, indicating that we have this time around for each envelope, we have we have the data, the, the envelope that has now been uh, smoothened 
removing the background noise. And it's this time around much more easier to be able to determine what the coherence length is. In effect, what we've been able to arrive at is the fact that our system, having to use a system where we keep the reference and the sample arm fixed, we, we are able to detect the presence of different samples, samples that allow microwaves to penetrate. And these samples usually have these samples have conductivities, uh, these samples conductivities are zero, meaning they, they do not conduct. Hence, we do believe that if we have biological samples, such as the human breast, which is made up of the fibro granula and then the adipose tissue, all with different refractive indices, as well as uh, dielectric constants. We can be able to employ the, this system to be able to detect any changes in the refractive index of the fibrogranular tissue and that of the adipose tissue. And by so doing, we would in effect be able to tell whether a tumor is in place. Again, with the information of the detector, the, the detection, the detector signal, we, we do believe that we can be able to extract some information such as the refractive index. We can also be able to obtain some information such as the, the uh, uh, dielectric constant of the material that we've inserted in, into our sample arm. So in conclusion, we've been able to implement an optical Fourier domain imaging system that uses microwave signals as a source. And from this system, we've been able to detect the presence of sample inserted for which we do believe that if this approach of detection is employed, we can be able to gather some baseline data needed for building a, part, a portable microwave imaging device for the early detection of cancer. Our main concern is not to obtain the 3D image of the cancer cell or the tumor. It's just to detect that there is a tumor that is present. So we seek, as we continue with our research, to have to mimic the breast and then embed within the, the breast that we've mimicked some different object sizes. And hopefully, if we are able to detect the presence of these objects, different objects within the the, 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 the phantom that represents the breast that we've mimicked, we, we are hopeful that indeed that can help us, help us gather some data that could lead to building a portable microwave imaging device just for the detection of, of, of cancer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for a very interesting talk do my applause here since I can actually find that. Thank Any you. questions? I see no hands up, so I'm going to ask one question. So um, is the wavelength that you that you're using do you think it's specific for breast cancer? Could it could the system be used for other types of cancers, for like ovarian, uterine can cancer? Um, the wavelength is within uh, three centimeters, and what we seek to uh, uh, do is uh, to just be able to detect that there is some tumor present 
at certain soft portions where light is not able to do much work in terms of a, 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 a OCT is not able to do much work. So wherever there is some soft tissue that you have some kind of, uh, you usually have some kind of tumor, we just believe if this system is employed, it just can help us detect that there has been some changes in that particular soft tissue and having no effects to it as well. As well. I see, okay. Well, thank you. Thank you for your talk. Thank you too. So the next speaker is, Lawrence. is a question. Oh, great. great. Elvis, please go ahead. Okay. I thought you didn't see me. Uh, okay. So that was a good talk. Uh, so are you with the physics department in the University of Ghana? Yes, please. Uh, which which, uh, which uh, lab? The lab Would that you? I I, I, yep, yeah. I use the uh, the level 200 lab. No, 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 no. We have, uh, the reason why I'm asking, we have some uh, breast cancer cells. I don't know whether uh, they can be of usefulness to your project. Yes, please, they can be. Yeah, then uh, uh, maybe we need to talk. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you too. So the any other questions for this this uh, this paper, this talk? So the next speaker I do not see in the Zoom room. Do I? I do not see the person on my console. Is Hamza here? So I guess then the thing to do is to move on to the next talk. Trevor, are you still here? I am here. Yes, I might. Yeah, there I am. I'll even turn on a video so you can see me. All right. So let's, let's do a quick <laughs> thing. Let's, before you start, let's do a quick thing, because I think Simon wants to swap time slots with you because he has a meeting to go to. Can we do that out, uh, out in the open right now, quickly? Simon, are you ready to go? Are you ready to, to give your talk? I, I am, but if Trevor keeps to his time of 20 minutes, I'll still be in time. I, I, I must leave at South African time, five o'clock. I'm a terrible session chair because I just have people. I, am I scheduled to speak in 20 minutes? You are scheduled to speak now. Speak now? Are... No, Ham, I'm sorry. Hamza was, was scheduled to speak now, but. Well, let's Simon take his slot. Not here. Okay, Simon, you go ahead. Okay. All right. I also start my video. Fantastic. And can I share screen? Uh, hold on one second. I'm multitasking like crazy. Uh, okay, so you should be able to share your screen now. Okay, you see my screen? Yes. Yeah. Okay, well, I just want to thank the organizers and everyone attending very much for, of course, the opportunity. And just to introduce myself again, I'm chairing the executive committee of the African Light Source. And our vision is there should be such a light source on the African continent. You've already heard something about this vision up to now. And the first slide is already uploaded and you will find links there to papers that have appeared previously, as well as the website from which you can look at uh, other details about the African light source. And I'm assuming you're reading the slides while I'm talking, so then I don't have to always say every detail in the slide. And I want to end with um, the point eight about the AFLS and biophysics, but that point will actually be a thread through the talk. So we are inspired 
on the one hand buy Sesame because um, it's partly owned by Egypt, which is an African <clears throat> country, and it's in the Middle East. It's also an international facility. That means many countries belong to it, uh, as opposed to some synchrotrons, which are national synchrotrons. And so there's this aspect of science diplomacy as well, uh, which goes beyond science. So there's a vision really of what role can a synchrotron play in an entire region or in our case, a continent. I also want to show you Brazil. It's also very inspiring, 90% local manufacture, looking very beautiful, a lot of space around, which is already starting to be occupied by a mega science park that is industries that spring up around the synchrotron to take advantage of all the analysis that they can do there. And already for well-established synchrotrons, this has gone into the second generation where you find students who got their PhDs at the synchrotron are now employed in these industries. And this has been a very transformative in, in how industry is really starting to depend on synchrotrons in order to develop and be competitive. Of course, we know what a synchrotron is, but I want to emphasize how multidisciplinary it is and also the involvement of industry. And then there are many advantages for Africa, but the science for peace, we particularly singled out the return of the African science diaspora I think particularly in the biosciences, we've seen very, very highly trained, excellent young minds being employed elsewhere, but they are young African minds. And then one always imagines how wonderful it would be for Africa if the people that are being trained by many of us here and so on could actually be attracted to remain in Africa. Okay, so um, it's very urgent. Uh, I want to just give a feeling of the sense of urgency. So people have actually mentioned already that we're the only habitable continent without one, but this slide shows the population demographics of the world where we really see that we need to make a plan for educating Africa's youth. This slide shows that if we were just to have one sixth of the first world's average of scientists, we need a million scientists now. We actually a long, long way from that. So, so it's it's a very very urgent. Now, um, the another view of the urgency comes that if you look at a map of the world and you just see so many synchrotrons, but yeah, we emphasize how many of them are undergoing an upgrade. Why would synchrotrons be undergoing an upgrade, not only um, having one there already? And the reason is they are still so important for science. One reason is these technological advances. So this is um, an advance in the production of x-rays by a factor of 100 that you can see in the diagram on the right, which has been extended uh, approaching uh, 10 to the 23 in brilliance in those units that you see over there. But it's not only the, the beam emittance, which has improved a factor of 100, but also the detectors. So the figure of merit is a factor of 10,000. So we are seeing a situation that uh, the rest of the world is implementing upgrades to get a factor of 10,000. So Africa needs to be on the starting blocks. So we have passed it. Now, this is just to show you with these um, advances in detectors and you add the two together with this factor up to 10 to the four improvement. You then find that you can do 4D or even 5D measurements. So the three of space and then you can get time in there as well. And some other parameter could be energy which tags a species or who knows what. But ultimately there can be 5D data acquisition. In actual fact, it transforms 
uh, many, many, many fields. And so it shows you, you know, Africa really needs to get in on this game. We often ask ourselves, who is African? Is it just someone born in Africa, someone with African ancestry? Is it someone who's now in the African diaspora? But we take the lead from Arikana Chihomburu Kwao, who was the AU representative to the USA until recently. We really are inspired by this definition. And so we can include all friends of Africa in this vision and the African light source. So for example, she has said, to be an African, you do not need to be born in Africa, but Africa must be born in you. And so with that, we can welcome anyone who shares this vision of a synchrotron in Africa to be on the road with us. This slide collects the multidisciplinarity of the light source, and you, you really see it. It's, it's African data here, I want to emphasize. There's a map and it shows all the places where geology is being done using synchrotrons. Uh, you see the cultural heritage, uh, paleo, archaeo, these are African data. You see interventions for Africa's disease burden, and then you see energy materials, and there are innovations. And innovation is what will enable Africa to also generate its own wealth and finally lead to the end of the colonization of Africa. So I just want to show you, there's a red book there, that's the CDR, and we are busy writing that conceptual design report. And um, here is the bioscience motivation that I, I really believe is one of the very, very, very strongest motivations for Africa to have a light source. Actually, when we say light source in Africa, we do not mean only one large mega instrument somewhere on the continent. You can't have a light source unless you have all the associated infrastructure. So that means there would be local and regional facilities. In that way, there's a symbiosis of the light source with every region, every scientist everywhere, because achieving the light source means that we will also have achieved quality equipment everywhere and critical mass of scientists everywhere. I'm sure I don't need to read through the slide, but it establishes showing also references, particularly for policy, policy makers, a point that's, that's not really easy to be very, very sure of, uh, but uh, of course we've, we've seen it with COVID in, in the way that light sources have been essential, essential services. They have remained open. The beam line that has remained open during the harshest of lockdowns has been the beam lines that uh, were on the front line of the fight against the coronavirus. It's very exciting because the conceptual design review writing has begun. We've got a whole new section now to our webpage, which is chronicling the development of the conceptual design review, which is an intrinsically Ubuntu process reaching out to every single um, African scientist, individuals and organizations to participate and we are seeing an, an excellent participation. Uh, people often ask, where will this be? And there's a list there of the requirements that uh, we've looked at so far in order for there to be a light source in a particular site. And this is as far as we're going to go. The CDR is not even going to make this decision. But after we can put a CDR on the table and policymakers and scientists and funders can read the CDR, see finally this is a very, very serious venture, that's when they will start to be bidding as to who could be the potential site. And then um, there again, you see um, a lot of the reasons that we are on this roadmap towards a light source. What does the roadmap consist of here are 12 points. 
initially you see points that are to do with what this conference is doing. It's just promoting human capacity development. It's building the linkages between scientists out of the connections at this conference and the work at this conference. There will be new collaborations. Many of them could extend now also to light sources, people from groups which maybe couldn't prepare samples, could now uh, collaborate with people who could and so on. So you can see that um, is, is initially not necessarily an extra expense. The, it can use all the existing things that we do in any way to build the relationships that raise the profile and build the vision, take us along the roadmap. And uh, we even are uh, quite well advanced on this number 11, which is the conceptual design report. And, and, and I know many of you are already deeply involved in that for the biosciences. Then here are just a few countries that are listed who have committed themselves to a light source. And, and um, the top amongst them really is Ghana whose president has pledged Ghana to champion the African Union. It was recently and even yet more recently, a few months ago, the science minister, then science minister, reaffirmed Ghana's support. And Benin has also taken an enormous lead and, and built a facility which is aiming towards production of 100 experts per year in, in uh, X-ray techniques, including the crystallography techniques, expressly seeing it as part of the roadmap and, and so on. So I, I can say that there are discussions with the South African government at the moment. The document on the right is, is um, encapsulating those discussions where there is the proposal that came from them to see the light source as a flagship project and what would that involve, obviously also support of local regional facilities and building capacity locally. And what are these regional facilities? Uh, it's, it's, it's really developing well. So um, you see some of them mentioned here. Apologies if yours is not here. I have more on others later. But um, you do see even a growth in access to these facilities, some of them that are even university facilities are behaving like regional facilities. And in this map, um, we have collected several uh, uh, such facilities that we would then call feeder facilities. And these are facilities with equipment that can already um, allow local and regional scientists to build a program at a light source. And you see Africa is becoming well populated. On our website, this um, picture is actually clickable and you can mouse over and go into presentations and things related to these facilities. We um, look just at bioscience capacity. It's a, even better populated. The previous one was material science. And so you, you, you see um, developing a, a threshold that um, often we hear, for example, in Sesame, I, I think I did see Andrea Lausi in the audience, uh, his number is 100 scientists in a discipline are necessary to support usage of a particular um, beam line at a facility. And so the question is, when did Africa reach this threshold? And our feeling in the African Light Source Group is that Africa reached this threshold long ago, if we are allowed to take scientists in the diaspora, of which there are many, and I think we should take them. This is in the case of paleontology, again, um, a very broad footprint in Africa. And then if we take it all together, we see a substantial coverage of Africa with uh, synchrotron usages. And one starts to see, yes, indeed, Africa could have its own light source. But please, um, we don't necessarily have to say this threshold thing is, is has to be true before the synchrotron, because we can look at the case of Brazil, which uh, earlier said we were very 
inspired by. And they picked up literally in the thousands of users by the time Sirius is nearing completion. And it's the most inspiring thing to attend one of their conferences and just see how many extremely excellent new young established researchers there are in any given field. So it's quite clear that the light source can be a driver. When it comes to industry, we, we can recognize that we already have a global player that you see the blue dots are the presence of offices of SASOL worldwide, particularly in Africa, using the synchrotron even to the extent of paying for beam time so that they can keep the research confidential. So if we look at the timeline, um, would like to especially point out the Kazmi Tingwa, who's in the audience, who was responsible for writing the light source in Africa formally into a document for the very, very first time and can be regarded as one of the dates, very important milestones to the establishment of a synchrotron. So that would be the, the balloon just to the bottom right of his name. And then you see a um, series of conferences and so on developing from there. And by now there's many formal linkages of the African light source in, in the continent, uh, in uh, pan-African organizations and international organizations. And also um, Gihan mentioned our, our memorandum of understanding, particularly uh, with Sesame. We have only two so far, Sesame and LAMP, um, but, but uh, is, we are very, very proud of our MOU with uh, Sesame and we will be building on it. And there, there are, are ongoing discussions how to concretize it in, in programs. And recently we formed the International Advisory Committee and you can just um, look through at the various people there. I want to point out in particular, Dr. Kotso Mokele, who's the chair. And uh, he was a leading figure to bring about the SALT telescope, which is an international facility in Africa. And then leading from there to the SKA, which is again, a global international research infrastructure in Africa. So- um, Simon, you have, you, you have like two minutes. Okay, that's good. So here we just mentioned the, this long history with um, uh, other light sources and you can go in more detail at our conference linked there and see the extent to which the African light source is supported by existing light sources and here I am at the last slide, which is to start to put down some strong linkages between African light source and biophysics. So, so for example, uh, training programs, building the user base, would like to help work towards the continuation of START and, and relationships with synchrotrons with building up local and regional equipment infrastructure. And then um, on the governmental side, um, building the government involvement, because ultimately we need governments to make positions at universities to hire the excellent students that are being produced and then propose things, for example, see the Oren Klug center become a regional center and uh, to strengthen Biostruct Africa and many other national, regional and African institutes. Um, and then we, we want to also build towards regionalizing these partnerships. So we must have a conversation about an African beamline at an international facility. Would this be at Sesame? Would it be somewhere else? But we need to look at that. It, it do, does Africa want to, to, to have an African bioscience beamline somewhere, for example, and then to promote multi-state memberships of an international facility? For example, we have SAESRF, but could we build from that 
towards uh, re regional ones. And I'd like to say um, we, we really are beginning these conversations and international organizations are assisting us. So for example, there's a very active conversation right now together with the IAEA and the AFRA um, program within the IAEA. So let me leave it there. Thank yeah. you very much for the opportunity. Thanks, Simon. Is there any uh, burning questions that uh, people or statements that people want to put out? Otherwise, uh, I let them go for one minute too long. Uh, Emmanuel, just quickly, while uh, you, have a, you have a quick thank you, thing. Uh, thank you very much, Simon, for the nice uh, presentation. Um, my question is, uh, considering the fact that um, it will take some time to build the, 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 the light source, how do we ensure that the pledge made by the politicians are kept? I say so because uh, the the, the, maybe the president of Ghana is not going to be in power for, for, for forever, right? So there will be that constant change of power. How do we ensure that the pledge they made is passed on to the next um, person taking over? I think one of the first things that we need is to grow towards a full-time office and much deeper relationships with science academies and almost a permanent relationships with governments and the Africa Union. And that will all start happening as we can really concretize the benefit that light sources have brought to all the sciences. And we know that but we need to communicate that and concretize that. Elvis, can I, can I ask you to put your, your question in the chat? So that okay, can... okay, that's fine. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Trevor, are you ready to start your talk? Let me actually yes. make, uh... all right, you're ready to do your screen? Let's give uh, Simon a round of applause. Please the reaction button real quick. I know where that is. And uh, if you have questions, put them in the chat. There's uh, actually several of us that are on the a AFLS board. Actually, the deputy chair is here, Sakazi. So he can answer the chat, the, the questions that are put in the chat as well. OK, so am I going to go? Yes, give it a go. Okay, I, I'm going to talk about the START program, which stands for Synchrotron Techniques for African Research and Technology. It was an application that we um, made about uh, five years ago to the, to the Global Challenge Research Fund of the um, Science and Technologies uh, Facilities Council. And the, the program, the program was built uh, in order to encourage South Africans to get involved, or Africans in general, to get involved with, um, with synchrotron usage. And I was in the, the uh, structural biology program, and the only people that we managed to recruit to the program were actually South Africans, which is a pity, but um, we would have liked to have had more Africans but at the time it didn't happen. So I'm going to talk from a South African perspective and, and social biology is really in its infancy in South Africa. We have fewer than a dozen PIs that are currently active in the field. We have fewer than 10 labs in which a protein can be prepared for structural work. We have four protein capable home source X-ray diffractometers. We have one cryo EM on a 30 year old platform, but it does have a new direct electron detector. We have no protein capable NMR spectrometers. We have four universities in which biochemistry courses include structural biology. And we have very limited local research funding
for structural biology. The situation in the rest of Africa, as far as I know, is considerably worse. And maybe I can be corrected on this point. Um, only in Egypt, I believe, have students returning from abroad been able to establish themselves as structural biologists actually doing structures in their home country. So I think that structural biology in Africa is a major development opportunity and a necessary development opportunity. So I'm going to just quickly outline the structural biology workflow, which includes sample selection, soluble expression of the protein, purification, and if you're going to do crystallography, obviously crystallization, data collection, data processing, interpretation, and ultimately publication. And a project cannot be completed unless every step can be accomplished. And that is a big problem. So the problems facing us in South Africa were that we had this lack of infrastructure for educating people, lack of infrastructure for preparing proteins, for characterizing proteins, for determining structures, and lack of infrastructure for big data and computing. We had inadequate funding for early career positions. We had few students, no money for projects, very little money for equipment. A national science infrastructure, which was not particularly transparent and in fact didn't really engage with the scientists to the, to the extent that would allow development to happen. And as a result of this poor planning, we, the whole system had a lack of credibility. So essentially we, we sought support in the beginning from the NRF and Department of Science and Technology, but we were successful in getting large scale support from the Carnegie Corporation of New York, the Ford Foundation, the Wellcome Trust and the Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft. And we developed a network of international collaborators that helped us eventually to, to, to get the major grant, the START grant, which helped everybody in the country. And so what START did was to create a UK Africa partnership to develop a program of world-class research based, based around energy materials and catalysis, which is strand one, and protein structure determination, which is strand two. And the grant funded extended training in synchrotron techniques. And the nexus was the diamond light source, the UK synchrotron. So researchers who studied um, in the program studied emerging and neglected diseases of direct importance to the African continent. And that was done through the structural biology program. So the motivation for, for hosting START, by the way, was that, that the, the UK gave money, which, would, which they hoped would develop um, African continent. And they believed that, that they would ultimately underpin the African light source. They would provide the, the, the network of people that would be able to ultimately use the African light source. So what we did was that we, we had lab visits, we had individual focused secondments, we had a two-way process uh, in which uh, postdocs in the UK visited Africa and postdocs in Africa visited UK. And we built this network of researchers around uh, the Diamond Central Hub. So, what in our bioscience component, the, the success was due to pre-existing infrastructure, which was built by nine co-investigators co at seven different institutions. And these institutions, as you'll see, are widely dispersed throughout our country. I think I've got a map. Um, but we also built a local resource center in Cape Town and we provided two posts at the resource center, which, were, which enabled people from throughout the country to come and use resources to replace any technology or technique 
that they did not have at their home institution. So people could come in and out of the resource center, use the bit that they, they needed and carry on with their project. So we were able to complete the workflow. Everybody was, able to, was enabled to complete the workflow. And we recruited a number of postdocs and then we started to extend the program to a number of other researchers at other universities, including places like the University of Zululand and the University of uh, uh, and Rhodes University. And we included more people at the other established universities. And they've all done extremely well. So the postdocs in particular have been have been was a were a wonderful idea. And many of them have actually found jobs and increased the size of the community that we have. So there, there are the, the places in which the, the, um, the people were, the Cape Town Free State um, in, in, the, in Pretoria and Johannesburg and in the Northwest and in Stellenbosch. So one of our first um, meetings was the, the Biophysics and Structural Biology of Synchrotrons and that was held in Cape Town. There was a face to face meeting when things, such things were allowed and those are the people that attended, which was um, a, quite a, a large community of, of international speakers came to the thing. You can see Mike Lawrence on the extreme right from Australia. Um, you can see uh, um, several other people that you will recognize. And um, we held a, a, a sponsored by, by ESRF, a, a meeting, a, a workshop on, um, on cryo-electron microscopy, which we held at the University of Cape Town as well. And so we, we were able to encourage people to try and use the ESRF facility in, in cryo-electron microscopy. So we've made a, a number of different contributions um, to, to biomedical science in the program. And these have included, uh, in particular, uh, contributions in, in vaccine design, in the design of, of uh, drugs and herbicides and pesticides, and the, the um, and antibody design, as well as industrial enzyme design. So, I just highlight, this is, this is a picture of ESRF, and um, it just shows you the, the scale of such a facility, which is important for people to realize that, that these facilities are extremely intense, equipment intense. Um, but our, our people using them have discovered new, new uh, ways of uh, well, discovered the way in which you can make an antibody for HIV, um, which has been a remarkable achievement of Tandeka Moyo at the NICD. And, um, and recently, we've done quite a lot of, of, of stuff in cryo-EM. And in fact, in the world at the moment, we have this convergence of macromolecular crystallography and cryo-EM. The, the, the extent of the convergence is shown here as a picture of diamond, where the cryo-EM at the bottom is, uh, is in, on the synchrotron floor. So one of, the, one of the beam lines is in fact a cryo-EM. In fact, there are now five cryo-EM beam lines um, at, at diamond. And, and it's no longer a niche technique. So you can clearly see, um, you can clearly resolve at the same level as you can do in the majority of cases in, in, in protein crystallography, but you don't need to make crystals. And, but, the, but in order to utilize this technique, you also have to set up a pipeline and you need to use the entire, uh, the, you need to have the entire pipeline at your disposal in one way or another. And because many of the steps are iterative and you have to optimize your samples at many different stages, the protein preparation, the staining technology, the microscopy, the grid preparation. Ultimately, we ship the material to the, to the, the cryo-EMs and we collect the data. Um, and this, this we discovered actually happens, can happen quite easily 
uh, through remote access. So we can ship in duos and, um, and unload the samples. By, well, technician at the diamond light source then um, unloads the samples into a Titan cryos microscope. We can collect the data, align the microscope, do everything remotely, and then, um, and then ship the data back, back to South Africa, um, and then process it on our own computers. By the way, the, 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 I would like to thank um, Lawrence actually for, for helping us to expedite getting a number of, of uh, GPUs from NVIDIA, which enabled us to make a really substantial computer without which we wouldn't be able to do any of this work. And so this is one of our, our early successes, which was the, the a microwave fiber, where we discovered the basis of, of substrate specificity for, for these important industrial enzymes. Um, I'm going to talk briefly about the Aaron Kluck Center. So our idea in establishing the, the Aaron Kluck Center was to create a, a, a top of the range electron microscope unit, which would support structural biology as one of its, one of its goals. The other goals being to support material science. And that's shown in the cyan region in the building plan at the bottom. It's, it's, on a, it's on a concrete slab, it's temperature controlled, humidity controlled, vibration controlled, everything actually. And, um, and it has been a remarkably successful building, enabling us to go forward with, with cryo-EM at, at well, not yet at the highest level, but at an acceptable level. So there is the layout. And there you can see people doing in, working in the crystallography lab and, um, and in fact, you can see that every step of the crystallographic process is available to users of the facility. And we created, a, to support the facility, we created the Structural Biology Research Unit under the, under the directorship of, of um, Jeremy Woodward, a young man who is extremely energetic and ha has focused largely on, on cryo-EM at the moment, and with myself and Ed Sturrock, supporting him. So I would say that, the, the, that all the structural biology groups in South Africa are now working together. In particular, we have a crystallography bag and a cryo-EM bag at the diamond light source. And we have many crystal structures and cryo-EM structures that have been determined. And we've established a mechanism to enable more people to become involved by giving free access to the resources of the Aaron Cook Center and by holding workshops conducted by leading experts. I will comment that the money that enables them to have free access is the, is the money in the start grant. And without that, they would not be able to have the free access. So we need, when the start grant ends, um, to, to find a mechanism for replacing that funding. And that, can, I believe, can only come from, from a government source. So we've held now just recently the CCP4 workshop. It was a virtual workshop. It was a wonderful occasion. Trevor, you have one minute. Okay. So, so the risks involved in doing structural biology are that funding remains extremely limited. And the largest threat that we face is the loss of members of our very small community. This means it's imperative that we find sustainable funding to, repay, to retain the people that we train. So those are the important messages, and those are the acknowledgements of all the um, places that have, all of the, the sponsors or the people involved in the START program, which includes many universities, that, but predominantly the Science and Technologies Facilities Council through the Global Challenge Research Fund, and of course the, 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 the manpower and knowledge to keep the whole show on the road has come from, from, from the Diamond Light Source. Okay, that's all I need to say. Okay, thank you. There was one question in the chat from the last talk about sustainability. I would like to actually reserve that question for after the, the upcoming talk because I think uh, I think um, one of her talk one of, one of her uh, subjects will be about sustainability and how do you sort of uh, keep going in the face of ad adversity. So then at the end of the next talk, then we can get into a general discussion about sustainability and how to shockproof our um, structural biology enterprises.
Does that sound like a good idea? Sounds sure. good. To me. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so Toyin is our next speaker who I don't see in the council. I'm uh, here. Oh yeah, right. Okay. It's every every few minutes the council <laughs> changes positions. Yes, I'm here. So okay. yep. So you can share your screen now. Excellent. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Let me see. Where is my screen? Make sure I'm sharing the right one. Oh, escape. Sorry. <laughs> I should be an expert at Zoom by now. Yeah, for really. yeah. I even went to the training course and I still don't know what's happening sometimes. Okay, one second, let me share. There we go. So can I get started? Yes, please. Okay, so um, after all this beautiful talks from Africa, I'm just gonna go ahead and introduce myself. I'm gonna talk a little bit about COVID proving a biochemistry education with crystallography at, um, research. Um, I'm part of the Afri African group, I'm Nigerian, and I work in the diaspora. Um, I'm the chair of the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry at Hampton University. Um, so let's see, the ultimate goal of this short presentation is to just avoid death by PowerPoint because we've all had a lot of talks this morning and I'm gonna try to get through this as fast as possible. If I'm speaking too fast, somebody please put your thumbs up or thumbs down and say slow down because my students always complain about that. So I will not go through a lot about crystallography, but I'm passionate about it. I'm a crystallographer and um, COVID has allowed us um, at Hampton, allowed me to really change how I teach and how I work with students. Um, we all know that um, protein crystallography or macromolecular crystallography or whatever form of crystallography follows the same rules as um, Lou Henry Sullivan said with architecture, form follows function. And so we take advantage of this in our daily um, endeavors. We've gone through this slide um, with all the previous speakers. Um, when we solve structures, we always have to make the protein, um, crystallize, collect data, solve the structure by getting either mad, sad, or um, molecular replacements or whatever. Um, and we refine the structure. But one of the goals I had when I moved from a research intensive university to Hampton, which is a um, teaching intensive um university or department where the highest level of um, training we have is a master's was to engage our students in all of these processes. We're a smaller university and currently we do not have a home um, in-house um, x-ray source for proteins. So that created a challenge for these stages, but fortunately being in the US, we could use the light sources. So my goal initially was to engage students at all the, the ste steps in the process, but of course COVID happened. So we ended up with a shutdown. So of course we all know about crystals, all shapes and colors. Um, you know, I won't go into this slide because we're in a room of experts. So, I decided when I joined Hampton in 2018 to engage students, researchers in all stages of crystallography from protein production, purification, crystallization, data collection, structure determination and refinement and in silico modeling. But like I mentioned, we ended up with COVID. So what was my um, understanding of this process? I wanted to work with my philosophy, which was that or any student can learn structural biology. Um, and regardless of if they're freshmen with limited amount of biochemistry or there were seniors that are like already set in their ways. Um, of course, with COVID, we, we had to make changes. And this started in the spring of 2020. And this started with my seniors 
um, with uh, seniors and graduate students with Chemistry 502, which is a research laboratory class. Traditionally, our students in this class, the way I taught it was they worked on a specific research project so that they could learn and master different biochemistry techniques. So they were supposed to clone, purify, and then possibly solve a structure during the term or the semester. So the students were following the steps involved in rational drug discovery, and they were learning how to produce a protein for drug discovery in the lab. And the, the initial focus was on the molecular biology and the extra crystallography and other wet lab techniques. They were conducting experiments, pipetting, doing traditional everyday things that students do. And they were working with um, a visiting postdoc from Brazil that I had in the lab at that point. COVID happened and we were shut down. Students were sent home. So we couldn't do what we had planned um, midway through the semester. So we had to change course. So what we, I decided was that, okay, you know what? We're gonna work like a small biotech company and do some drug discovery for COVID-19 and use tools that are available for free because when COVID happened, I hadn't even set up everything in terms of accessibility for different software that, that I paid for anything for the students. So I had to go, okay, you know what? Freeware, let's do some stuff. And we went ahead and we did that. And what happened was the students actually totally blew my mind. Um, we ended up developing a lot of um, ideas for future training programs. Our students learned how to use new bioinformatics tools. Students could predict which compounds will likely be inhibitors or not. And students actually learned a very important skill that was important. Um, critical for being a scientist, how to give and receive feedback. Um, these are just a couple of images that were generated by um, some of the students in the program. And I, and I will say that none of the students were thinking about like um, PhD per se before. Most of them were thinking about fa um, FAMD, PhD and um, um, MD or the like. And it ended up being that after participating in this, some of them actually course corrected and was and were like, you know what, maybe we'll think about a PhD. So in the summer, COVID continued. And I ended up with a few projects that I worked with with our students because of um, the shutdown. One of this was with this young lady, Adira, um, who was a visiting summer research through the McNair program. And I decided to work on a project with her on drug repurposing of small molecule inhibitors of, of, of Eastern dimethylases for schistosomiasis. So what she actually learned from this project was a lot of the same things that my um, Chem 502 students mastered, as well as scientific communication and scientific literacy. Summer continued and I decided to take advantage of my ongoing collaboration with Pete Myler, as well as Sadia Subramanian and Bart Sanker over at the um, Seattle Center for Structural Genomics. Um, one second, Seattle S Structural Genomics Center for Infectious Diseases. So we decided to try a pilot program with two of our students, um, Lauren, who was, uh, who was a rising junior, and Dylan, a rising senior, on um, writing and analyzing some of the, manus um, some of the man manuscripts on some of the structures that have been generated by the SSGCID. So currently, they are writing manuscripts. They are developing all the skills to analyze structures that have been previously solved. Um, Lauren is actually gonna continue on this project and do some um, analysis um, on the structures and some biochemistry and bio, um, um, also some other assays when she returns to campus in August. Unfortunately, Dylan would have graduated and started pharmacy school, so he won't be able to continue 
working, but we're gonna end, end up with those this 200 graduates getting at least a paper each by the time they graduate. In addition to this two, we have other undergraduates that are working with the SSGCID and their repertoire of hundreds of structures that have been solved as part of their structural genomics initiative has proved to be a, a, a treasure trove that can be used to train students in structural biology. So in the fall and the spring, this current semester, COVID kept us shut down still. So I decided that we're gonna engage our students in writing structure manuscripts and working on scientific literacy, teamwork and science communication. And the things they learned, they continue to work with the treasure trove of structures from the SSGCID. They learned how to use PyMol, Chimera, League Plot, PDB sum tools, tools within the PDB repertoire and all sorts of things that I never thought about. Um, before I started, my students gained all this stuff just because we were shut down from COVID. So challenges of opportunities, lack of support. We all know about that. Um, <laughs> lack of funding, that it takes money to do a lot of what we do. Um, of course, I always put this as a yin yang situation because we have to think about it as like opportunities for collaboration. Creative thinking is of the essence if you're gonna do structural biology and protein crystallography. And of course, we need to continue to work on increasing diversity. You know, as an African in the diaspora, um, what I learned when I started doing crystallography um, in 1993 was like, I would walk into rooms and I was the only person that looked like me. And I still am the only person that looks like me in a lot of conferences. So uh, it's been my um, life passion to actually engage more people um, and increase diversity. So I look at that as a challenge and an opportunity as well. And of course, intellectual and personal growth, not just for the student learners, but as, um, for, for the faculty involved as well. I would say that COVID shutdown has been kind of like a blessing in disguise. Pre-COVID, this was a number of students I was engaging in um, bio, bio, biophysics, structural biology type research in my lab, right? Per semester, post-COVID, this is the number. So um, the lessons that we've learned or I've learned um, um, in this process as an instructor and as a departmental chair will surely enhance how I engage future undergraduate researchers um, in research and coursework. Of course, this is a, this is a couple of links to useful websites. Um, I think anybody interested in using free tools because money, 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 money is a big deal need to definitely go to the clicktodraw.org because they've already put together all the information we need in terms of the software that is out there, the hundreds of software that is out there. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel and be searching for them. Just go to this website, okay? And these were a lot of two um, websites that I always made sure my students had access to. And I will thank you for your time. And I hope sincerely that with the speed at which I talk, I have brought us all back to um, on time for present for for this, and with that, I'm done. Okay, thank you, thank you. Very nice talk. Uh, let's see, there was someone was sending me a question in the chat, but if there's any questions, go ahead, please. Hey, Toy, and this is Jermaine. Hello, everyone. Hi, uh, hi, Jermaine. <laughs> I am I am a, a good friend and colleague of Toyin, so um, I my sentiments are the same. And thinking through what she just presented and integrating kind of some of the previous talks together, um, how do we engage? Um, how do we build the community internationally? Um, I know that we're very zoomed out, but um, but there are a lot of platforms where we can engage students across the continents to to kind of do this kind of peer-to-peer -peer mentoring and, and encouragement. So is there some sort of format that has trainees like a Slack channel or, or can we start that so that we really kind of build this, this pool of people interested in getting this information? Um, I, I will answer that. Um, I think that one of the mistakes we make when we're trying to engage trainees is we forget that trainees have their own interests. 
Um, I've been pretty successful with engaging trainees at Foot Nina and other universities in Nigeria because they're interested in the same research questions that I'm interested in. So that's the first place that we start. Like, of course, the technicalities come after that. But the first thing we have to make sure we remember when we're trying to develop all these collaborations is that they have their own interests as well. So my long-term successful relationships always come from people that have shared research interests. So, you know, so that's, that's my small experience, N of one. <laughs> I agree. So how do we how do we create profiles of of us around, you know, around structural biology and biophysics in Africa to get interested students and interested subgroups? And I mean, that's not directly toward you, Toyin, but, you know, I think I think that this is kind of the continuum so that, you know, we have the same issue. How do we create this this pipeline and and where do we start to really um, get students interested and sustain that. If I, if I could chime in here, I think there's two salute, two, two issues and, and, and two solutions. One is, uh, can we, can we MOOCify to make a massively online course, uh, a structural biology course? And uh, we might be able to generate some interest like uh, through edX. I think they're even offering grants for people to, um, I use the word MOOCify, which is a word I'm trying to socialize in the world. But um, yeah, if you could MOOCify your course, and then we can sort of create a library of, uh, of courses. Now, it is true that people have, uh, people have their interests. And uh, I mean, I've talked to a student who wanted to, I, I guess, try to crystallize a glutathione S transferase because, uh, well, I, I talked to the student about the fall ar army worm problem and how do insects avoid pesticides through uh, the glutathione S transferase. Trevor might remember this, well, we talked about this a couple of years ago. Um, so actually, if the student was in a rural community that was being sort of uh, uh, invaded by fall army worms, Getting samples would not be a problem because it's like it's, these these uh, they're basically locusts. I mean, they they come by the millions, and there's actually a protocol for them to uh, to do the isolation, purification, and all of that. There's actually even kits for it. That goes to the other issue: is how do people get equipment like pipettes and all the wet biochemistry that uh, you know a school would need to have. Um, that's, a, that's a huge problem. So um, in the end, I mean, there's sort of knowing about structural biology and then there's actual doing structural biology. Mm -hmm. And the part A of doing structural biology is just the basic white chem the wet chemistry. And then, I mean, if you have good crystals, there's beamline times around the world for, for, uh, for analysis. So, so using the light source is actually the sort of the end of the beginning, right? Go ahead, Toyin. I was gonna say that we need to build on existing collaborations. And I think part yeah. of the problem is that there's a lot of information deficits out there. For example, um, if you want to solve some structures that are relevant to infectious diseases, you can actually send a proposal with your sequence to the people over at the SSGCID. And if it's something that falls within the purview of the contract that the US federal government has given them, they will solve the structure for you. They will pro produce the protein for you. And those kind of things, opportunities exist. Now, the issue is that we don't always know about these kind of opportunities while we're busy doing our stuff. So part of the thing we need to do, and I think this is where Jermaine is getting to, we need to develop information, um, um, almost like information hubs where we can actually have a priority of the information and a lot of the information out there so people can know that these opportunities exist. Um, because there's no point reinventing the wheel. Yes, 
my, my, my collaborators at Food Mina want to purify and express a lot of proteins that they want to work on, but they do not have the facilities. So maybe the easiest way to do it is just send the sequence to um, the folks at the SSGCID. And if it gets accepted as one of the ones that they are going to make, they make it for them. And they can even send you the protein that is made already in, in addition to the salt structure that go, gets deposited for you. So those kind of opportunities for collaboration exist. So we need to, to develop information hubs. Um, as to um, how do we get these things going? I don't know. If I knew Jermaine, I would be a millionaire. <laughs> so so the, the SSGI, they will actually crystallize it for you or they'll just express it for you? They will purify, they will actually clone purify, crystallize if it works because they have a pipeline process, right? right? Yeah. So what you do is you send them the sequence, right? Um, through their website and, you know, they can, and it's not just them that will do that. There's all the other contracts, um, you know, all those other big contracts, the genomics contracts, the three of them will do that for you. It's one of the mandates that they have. Now, this is the flip side, the sad side. Um, we don't know if their contract will be renewed, right? Because it's, the time is running out. So once the time runs out, that opportunity goes away. But right now it's still there. So I'll greatly, and Pete will be like, why am I advertising this? Well, I'm gonna advertise it. You should go to the website for the, C the, the SSGC ID, okay? And that will be, you know, and anybody that has other questions about similar programs like that can feel free to get in touch with me. My, I guess my information is, um, you know, on there, but Google is a really good search for finding some of those things because I didn't even know that opportunity existed until I started Googling these things. Um, yeah, I've been trying to connect those uh, both uh, SS, the one in Seattle and the one in Chicago. I'm trying to connect those to Africa for a couple of years now. Okay. So that's good. That's. Um, I can, you know, I can work. Yeah, with we you. can we can work on that offline. Okay. Uh, any other questions? Uh, there was so there was a question about sustainability. Trevor, are you still here? Hello, Trevor. Yeah, yeah I call it. Yeah, oh, so El Elvis had asked a question at the end of the uh, Simon's talk, and yeah. I thought you might want to comment on sustaining centers like the AKC. And when you're done, I'll make a little contribution about sustaining light sources. Well, actually, Andrea is here. Andrea, Andrea, if you're listening, I hope you can speak to that. Unmute. Sorry, uh, so it's always difficult. All right. So let's so let's let's Trevor talk about the sustainability of the AKC. And Andrea, if you would, let's talk about uh, let you talk about the sustainability of a storage ring facility. Yeah, but it's the, the one million dollars question. The several million dollars question. It's uh, um, these. <laughs> these facilities are indeed expensive to maintain. So it, the, 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 the only way in a region like the one in which sesame is put is to find out, uh, uh, to, 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 to increase the memberships uh, in order to increase uh, the amount uh, of, uh, of funding available. It's because the, 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 otherwise it will be impossible to, to keep going uh, uh, in sesame, yeah. So sorry, I didn't start the video. I, yeah, it's starting. Um, so it is a problem. It it it, it has to be taken into account uh, uh, from the very beginning that uh, there will be a recursive cost, uh, which will never disappear. Actually, it will it will it will actually increase because the more beam lengths you have, the more stuff you will need to have. Uh, uh, in place, and uh, uh, you want to keep go keep developing new new instruments, uh, and uh, so I would say that it's it's of paramount importance to find out the boundaries of these numbers uh, in in your facilities, which have to be uh, uh, let's say. Mm, paired to the to, 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 to the number of uh, to which and the number of beam lengths that you are going to build around the ring. Uh, obviously, it, on the on the other side, uh, the more beam length you you build, the better you are using the entire facility. 
Yeah, it's a it's a simple matter of fact that uh, the, the, the synchrotrons obtain economical um, uh, viability if they do have uh, some six to ten beam lines at least. Uh, otherwise, the investment is is too large for for a, for, for a too small a uh, community. Okay. So Trevor, what, so you have a sustainability issue with uh, your cryo EM facility. Yeah, we have sustainability issues at a number of levels. Um, at, at, the, at the one level is that this equipment is not within our capacity in South Africa to manufacture. So we have very limited, we have a very limited base of technical people that are capable of repairing it or, or even sourcing spare parts. And we are dependent on the manufacturers, which are generally abroad. And they have they operate through agents. And the agents have different levels of technical expertise. So what, what we encounter is extremely long turnaround times for any kind of repair. And this, is, this goes down to even things like chromatography systems and spectrophotometers, everything everything has to be imported and everything has to be replaced by a qualified technical person. So you have to employ a qualified technical person. And that means that we should be, we, we in South Africa should be generating in the open market qualified instrument technical staff rather than depending on on agents who will charge exploitative prices for the repair of any scientific instrument. Now, once you once you start going into that domain, level fantastically expensive. And that's and that's unreasonable. The other thing is that that we we don't have a ready supply of students because students students have to be funded. Students have to have to have money for accommodation and food, and indeed they have to pay for their studies. So it's, it's not easy in Africa to find people with the resources to actually undertake studies in structural biology, which requires substantial commitment in, in, in time and energy and all of these things. And so you can't really work at the same time as you study structural biology. So there are, the, then at the level of, of actually doing the research, we have an extremely cash-strapped um, National Research Foundation in South Africa. We at least have a National Research Foundation, which is, which is a blessing. But it's extremely cash-strapped. And so the typical costs of a structural biology project are, are, are beyond them in general. So they receive all these applications from people that are aspirant structural biologists, and they throw almost all of them out. In fact, we've had a drought for the last several years in which not a single structural biology project was funded by the National Research Foundation. So these are all aspects that impinge on how you would do structural biology at a synchrotron or how you would actually get a synchrotron to be operational in the African continent. Yeah. That's maybe all I need to say. Um, any other comments before I, before I say? So uh, one of the things that you might've seen in one of Simon's slides was uh, he talked about the sort of the capital cost of building an African light source and then the ongoing maintenance costs. So he said, uh, uh, I think the slide says $1 billion in construction costs and then $2 billion over, um, I think it says over 20 years or something like that. Because so the, the rule of thumb is whatever, whatever you construct, the yearly operating cost is 10% of that. So I, so I guess that's how you get to $1 billion construction and then $2 billion over, over 20 years. But, you know, I think those sort of things are changing because, uh, you know, the cryo EM. So I just noticed that it's like 
Erica Ullman Sapphire just bought a trials, right? So she may or may not send crystals to, uh, to, a, to a storage ring light source as much as she used to, right? And, and the director of chess, I think he, uh, we had a meeting with him like two weeks ago. I think he said something like capacity is at 70, that, that utilization is at 70% of capacity because of prior OEM and because of efficiencies in sending crystals in. So it seems like the sustainability of, of the facility, of the large scale facilities is um, one problem, whereas local facilities are a different problem. Um, but how, so what are some other issues that we have in terms of challenges of, of structural biology and sort of uh, resource constrained environments, teaching? Emmanuel, what, is, what are some of your thoughts on this? I think Elvis wants to contribute. His, his hand is up. Who's this? Oh, Elvis? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Um, so uh, uh, the so sustainability plan for Africa. I think, um, you know, Trevor just touched on a couple of issues that we are facing. Um, I think one of the things that we need to start looking at is how do we create a core facility? Say that uh, not every university, not every center will have to have a structured biology facility to be able to run that. But if in Africa we can create a facility where uh, people can have easy access. And I think South Africa is leading the way. Um, I will think that uh, we start looking at that so that you don't have to actually run your samples within your local universities. You can ship the samples out to be run for you. Uh, you just have to deal with uh, knowing how to express the protein if you are doing uh, things like uh, structural biology, and then you just ship the, the samples for uh, analysis. I think that would be one way that we can probably sustain uh, you know, structural biology uh, research uh, on the continent. Uh, and the reason why I'm saying that is we have a 600 NMR machine in uh, University of Ghana, and it's just draining the university financial resources, liquid nitrogen, helium, uh, the number of uses are not even so many. And I think it's becoming unsustainable. Uh, it's a major problem. Mm. Thank you. Okay. You know, I think, so we have a talk in this conference on NMR of disorder proteins. Is that, that's tomorrow, Trevor, is that correct? I think so. Yep. So maybe that's an interesting sort of a thing where place where we can go. Um, any other questions or comments, inputs? So I think one of the things that we'll do, uh, Emmanuel, is we'll, we'll follow up with Toyin about uh, the, uh, the two centers, the one in Seattle, the Seattle and the Chicago Structural Genomics Centers, I think. Yeah. And uh, I think they, so I, di I didn't know that they would express their protein for you. That, that's that's awesome, actually. Um, and then uh, we'll see how um, we can actually. There's a move in Congress to do more foreign assistance in science for Africa. Uh, we can explicitly write that into the bill uh, because the the um, the Africa subcommittee of the U.S. House of Representatives part of their mandate is global health. So it's it's uh, through that through that hook, Representative Bass, who you may uh, know of uh, and and worked with, 
So this is probably something that we can make work. And it might be something, go ahead, Tonya. Also, we should try and build on the World Bank founded Africa Centers for, of Excellence. Right. Because those are universities that already exist and have funding, and some of them are actually interested. Like, like when I mentioned Foot Mina, Federal University of Technology Mina, it's one of those programs. And that's one of the programs I'm working to through to do my structural biology work in Nigeria. You know, so we need to work to, through existing programs because there's a lot of existing programs that we can take advantage of, you know. And so that's, you know, maybe the big thing is just to have a lot of these people get together, you know, so that, you know, we're not all on different pages. I think that's where we are, you know, just close that communication gap and maybe we'll get a lot, um, a, a lot more achieved with the synchrotron and biostruct Africa. Uh, yeah, we can, we can definitely think, think of those things. So let me just ask this one last thing for just as a teaching crystallography standpoint. I mean, if a student, you know, just sends a sequence off to some place and it gets cloned and expressed, right? I don't really like my father who used to talk about how he had to go to shove coal into some boiler when he was a boy before school. But it seems like half the half the thing of structural biology is, you know, doing all that stuff. Yeah. And then you could you could just off cart it away. Is that well, cool? <laughs> I, I think we gotta realize that at the end of the day, um after we've solved the structure, so what? Yeah. Right? So what? What do we do with the structure afterwards? Right. You know, one of the things that, that COVID has taught us is that automation is going to take ch take a, a change and it's going to change how we do things. OK. One of the things I do with my students um, when they are here in person is um, I get undergraduate students essentially repeating my six year Ph.D. project, um, cloning the protein and solving the structure all yeah. the way in the summer. Yeah. So we need to realize that things change. And okay. our students learn a lot virtually. There are lots of simulations that can take them through the entire process from purification all the way to expression and uh, solving the structure. Um, and of course, we're not gonna go back to the days of phenol chloroform extraction of DNA from um, plant sources so that we can now PCR it and clone it when gene scripts can seek them, can seek, um, synthesize the gene for us in one week. You know what I mean? So we right, need to realize yeah. that things are changing. So the, what do we expect of our students? Ourselves as instructors, we need to change with the times. And yeah. learners are gonna learn different things. And what are we teaching them that will save them from become, becoming obsolete as 21st century learners? Yeah. You know, I know. I, right, it's like we're, I guess we're the ones that are obsolete as the 21st century structural biology. Yeah, like, we yeah, are. Yeah, it take me a month to do this. Now he's got, got this. It takes us, but, yes. Um, so, can I add something? Sure. Help. Yeah, but I think also it, uh, it depends on the type of protein you are dealing with. For instance, if you are working with membrane protein, uh, I'm not sure somebody can just express it uh, for you to do the work. Um, the other thing is, uh, when I was in the US, we used to outsource uh, protein synthesis to companies. And they tell you that it's 95% pure. Uh, you run it through HPLC and then you find out that uh, uh, it's not what they see. So, um, we just need to know what exactly we are doing with it. And I agree with uh, the last speaker who says, um, expressing the protein, getting the structure, so what? Yeah. Uh, it, has to, it has to be linked to function. So uh, I think with biophysics or structural biology, you really need to learn right from protein pur uh, expression, purification, all the way. In fact, uh, running might not even be something that you need to do yourself. If you can express the protein, purify it, go through the labeling process, 
especially in NMR, somebody can run it for you. And then you just do the uh, structural uh, uh, elucidation. And I think that will be enough. Right. Yeah. Okay. So we come up on uh, 20 minutes after the hour. So this was like our the scheduled stopping time. So if there's nothing else, uh, let's uh, give, give everyone a round of applause. If I go into reactions and hit, and I do a thumbs up, and I'll even do the heart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So thank you, everyone. And so our, the, the conference be, starts again tomorrow morning at uh, 10 o'clock GMT plus two, which on the East Coast here, that's in the United, East Coast of the United States, that's 4 a.m. So I'll see you guys at 4 a.m. my time. Oh, okay. Thanks All right, so it's 10, 10, 10 a.m. GMT plus two, which is the same as Central Africa time. It's the start time tomorrow. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Yeah. All right.